Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my underground lair. <laughs> What's up guys, it's Charles, MX Revival. I am feeling so good. We just got back from the T-1000 ride day. We delivered T-1000 back to Mark Tilly at Dirt Bike Magazine and it was just an epic adventure, a good time, a great experience all together. And so, you guys know that whole bike was vapor blasted pretty much start to finish and you saw a little bit of vapor blasting but I didn't really tell you guys how to do it. Now part of that was due to the fact that I'm also perfecting my craft and always learning something new but I thought today I'd show you guys like how I do it what media what size media what blast PSI and some of the different things I've tried you know I feel like there are a lot of videos out there about vapor blasting but they're more like hey I vapor blasted this part or hey I built this vapor blaster out of a Harbor Freight you know dry blast cabinet and those are great no hate on those but there aren't really any unless I'm missing them like modern day right now bike building vapor blasting videos so today I want to share those things with you and show you how I do it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take something like this, super nasty, greasy, dirty, covered in gasket material, and turn it into, uh, you know, something like this. Just a refreshed, ready to use, beautiful engine case. Now before we get started, I do have some disclaimers. Some people are going to click on this video just to see, hey, what the does that guy know? You might be crusty, you might be one of those guys that doesn't like to share, and I feel like people don't like to share. People think that you're coming for their job, but uh, for you guys, that puts you at a crossroads. You can either go ahead and say something cool and modify some of the things I show today, some things that maybe I don't know, you can teach me, you can teach others, make us all better, or not. The choice is yours. 90% of the people that watch this video will be enjoying the video and they are not going to run out and buy an $8,000 blasting cabinet. So, you know, if that's your mentality, uh, the world doesn't work like that anymore so I may catch heat from this video but uh, it doesn't matter to me and honestly what I do know so far uh, has been a lot of trial and error I have had some good mentors some guys that have shared some things with me that helped me get to this point but even still they could tell me exactly what to do and I still had to make mistakes and try different medias and get finishes that I wasn't really quite fond of before I figured out how to get to this point. So either way, everyone has to go through their learning curve with it. So before I go ahead and blast this dirty case, there are some things I'm gonna need to do. We're gonna go ahead and strap the GoPro into the chest mount. I am going to need to heat up and remove a couple of bearings. We're gonna use an impact screwdriver and then I need to remove all the gasket material uh, on this case that's left over. Now for reference, this is a pretty decent set of 1989 RM2 50 cases that I found on eBay for a project I picked up for myself, which who even knows and I'll get into that. But huge shout out to Vintage King back in New York, their eBay store. Uh, this case ended up having a little crack and uh, I let him know and he fully refunded my money. I didn't expect that. So top notch customer service. And now I have that money to send this case out to get repaired. Dave Allen, Jim Hassaker, if you guys are watching, thank you for all the tips that got me to where I am. So far up to this point in vapor blasting, you guys have been a tremendous help and I appreciate you being there for me. You guys need to check both of them out on Instagram. So let's strap up the GoPro, let's get into this thing. We're going to go ahead and knock out some bearings, scrape the cases clean, get all the grease that we can off of them before we put into one of my two blast processes today and then we're gonna make it beautiful, so enjoy. All right guys, here we are on the bench and this is the finish we are shooting for this thing uh, when we started it had like mildew and green moss on it looked like it was uh, living under the ocean so this is kind of what we're going for today so I'll show you how to get this finish and again I think this will be an awesome learning experience if you have anything to add to the video put it in the comments below make us all better I'm sure finishes can be even brighter than the ones I am making today and this is kind of what we started with there's a little bit of that green stuff on there but it was much much worse on the other side kind of this mossy i used to live outside uh sadly kind of a color of junk on there so we're going to clean this up and we're going to make this look like that so as we go we will talk about some of the tools we are using of course i have paper towels always brake cleaner is pretty much my go-to uh you know spray the rag wipe your hands sort of deal we need a torch because we are going to be taking some bearings out of this today we need an impact screwdriver because we need to remove this power valve governor. And the only way to do that is with a little bit of force. And then lastly, we're going to get these studs out, which uh, requires a couple nuts, a little bit of heat and some muscle. So once we get those little things out, uh, seals, bearings, power valve governor, studs, all the gasket material and uh, all this crud off, drain plug, all that crap, we will be able to start the blasting process. Now you may have also noticed these pieces of wood. A lot of professional engine builders have a nice little wood block where they set engine cases on when they are doing their little poundings and what have you. 
Uh, I do not have one of those yet, and a parts washer would also be nice, but as you can see, although I am a master of spatial relations and have a great layout in here, I just don't quite have the room for the parts washer, but back to the wood and a little wood block that you'll see a lot of pro engine builder use. I don't have one. Uh, I'm not a professional engine builder, and uh, I'm more of a professional do whatever the f I want her. So uh, having said that, we'll be using these pieces of wood when we are doing the pounding with the impact screwdriver to get these particular screws out. All right, so we'll start today's video with some low hanging fruit and that would be this bearing down in here. It does not have any retainers holding in. We just need a little bit of heat, a little bit of force and that thing should fall right out. So uh, for example, you can see this clip holding this other bearing in. So if you don't look for stuff like that uh, and you start whacking away, you're gonna destroy your cases, obviously. So just be aware of little things like that, little retainers holding your bearings in. And we're gonna start with the torch and uh, this thing should come out real easy. So you're gonna wanna take your torch and heat the aluminum best you can rather than the steel of the bearing because you are trying to expand the aluminum so that the bearing just sort of falls out. Now, I don't remember where I heard it, but I heard or read or watched that the optimum temperature is about 170, and I could be wrong. Well, okay, we're about 100 degrees with the heat gun. Give her a little more. Give her a check. 128. Just give her a tap and just see. And just, guys, these cases could be very hot, so be very careful. I'm just going to use the socket. Oh, see, I just pushed it out with my hand. I was going to tap it with the rubber mallet, but there it is. Free as a bird, so... 130 degrees did the trick and now it will be much easier to knock out this seal bearing could be very hot So be careful go ahead and tap that seal out There she goes seal is free So now we're going to move on to that little screw right there We're going to use the impact screwdriver now make sure you use the tip that is appropriately sized for the screw I think that's a number three pretty sure yeah number three uh, a lot of screws are number two uh, If you stick the number two in that number three you're going to strip it You're going to have a hard ass day and then also make sure that your torque screwdriver is Rotating in the proper direction when you slam this thing Bow it forces the screw down and turns at the same time. That's how you get these out a lot of times these screws have Loctite on them You don't want to strip them. It really sucks get you a little single jack people always make fun of me for using this but Always seems to do the trick now doesn't it there you have it proper size bit and the proper size screw Little clip is free. Be careful. This stuff could still be very hot as the heat transfers through the aluminum. But now that bearing can come out just like the other one. We're going to go ahead and get this power valve governor out the same exact way. This screw here, it looks a little buggered up already. So somebody uh, did something funny and maybe didn't use the impact driver on that. So hopefully it comes out. Hopefully I don't get screwed. Either way, uh, oh, no pun intended, I guess. Either way, we're going to go ahead and continue the job so you guys can see my blast pressures, all that stuff. All right, so now we need to get this power valve governor out. And as mentioned, that screw is already a little boogered up, unfortunately. It probably means that at some point, this bike being as old as it is, somebody probably accessed this, tried to take it out, or did take it out, replace it, and reuse that screw. Don't ever reuse those screws. There's also the slight chance that they didn't use Loctite, which would be good in our case, but this is also a different size Phillips. This is a number two, so again, always check that. And then we're gonna go ahead and uh, give this thing a whack. But also, I should mention, this thing has, oh, cases are hot. This thing has the uh, locating dowels pretty much seized in it. Uh, so I'm gonna leave those in if you're doing the same thing. Uh, go ahead and make sure that when you do your slamming and banging that you do not have the case resting on that. You want to at least have the case off the side of your wood blocks here, which also now you guys have kind of figured out why the wood blocks are here in the first place. So let's get that thing knocked out. Boom. It worked. Okay, good. And we're going to throw that right in the garbage. That one is also free. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, this close on the GoPro is a little tough sometimes, but there is a little bit of Loctite on there. Kind of a reddish, pasty looking stuff. Garbage. Don't ever use that again. Out comes Mr. Governor and 
be mindful of anything that might fly out. If you guys are wondering what this piece is for, this rod normally goes up into your exhaust valve on the cylinder and as the engine spins and enough centrifugal force is created, this thing starts to open and close, uh, which actually forces the rod up or down and opens or closes the exhaust valve up here. And that's that boom, that two stroke power band you feel. So that's what this is all about. Mechanical, very reliable versus let's say Honda uh, RC, which we just finished building T1000. So, so this bearing is in there. We're going to need a blind bearing puller to get that out because I cannot knock it through from either side. So we do need one more additional tool in today's arsenal. We'll go ahead and grab that. Now these are pretty amazing for all sorts of things. Uh, bearings that only go in one way, uh, linkages, swing arms sometimes. We got this little eight millimeter collet and I'm hoping that, oh yeah, it fits in there, thankfully. So the blind bearing puller uses a slide hammer. Basically, this part has a little shelf on it or some hooks, goes into the bearing, and then this guy here drives or flares this open as it has a wedge here. So as you tighten this up, it expands inside the bearing, and then you use this guy, goes into the end of the collet, these are called collets, and you do that, pull it out, knock it out uh, until she comes flying across the room. So that's what we're gonna do to get that guy out since we cannot push it either direction through the case. Again, heat is our friend. Uh, now that this is in there, I'm along for the ride. I should heat it first, but it doesn't really matter. Just uh, don't touch it if it's hot. And we're gonna try and find the best place to get this done from. You can do this a couple ways. You can hold the case down and bang the slide hammer up, or you can flip the case over, which actually you can go ahead and pin this into the table and pull the slide hammer down. I'm just gonna do it as it sits. There you have it, done deal. Guys, it's worth mentioning, I will leave a link in the description below for you. I actually have a listing on the site that encompasses all these tools, all the special things you need, uh, clutch holder, flywheel holder, impact screwdriver, blind bearing, puller, stand, all that stuff. I call it the Garage Hero Bundle. So I'll leave some info for that down below. Really affordable, will last you a lifetime, and you're able to then disassemble engines like this and put them back together. So check that out if you have time. And we are moving right along. We need to get these studs out. These can be very stubborn. And sometimes uh, they come out with bits of aluminum in them from the case. And when that happens, it's unfortunate. It can, of course, be fixed. But the goal is to get these hot enough to where that doesn't happen. And we're going to go ahead and use a little jam nut system here where you go ahead and apply one nut to the stud and then another nut to the stud. You tighten them together and then heat everything up use a wrench and because this top nut is jamming this lower nut on, we should be able to spin the stud out of the case. So let's do it, we need that heat again. You can use an impact gun to tighten this top nut. Just make sure that you're not letting the force go past your wrench and into the case. You don't wanna spin this thing any deeper or potentially strip anything. So hold everything at bay here. And I always like to see if they will come out before I actually apply the heat because there's always a chance that they will. Be mindful when you're holding this down that you're not gonna get burned. And look at that. She's spinning without heat. That takes a lot of uh, heartache off you, some extra labor. Uh, also the risk of whatever corrosion could have been in there, gumming things up and pulling the aluminum out with it. So that's really, really great. And then once it gets easier, you can hang this thing over the edge of the bench and kind of just go in a circle. And you can even throw your wrench on the ground if you want. Sometimes they'll get a little sticky. If that's the case and it gets hard to rotate out, bring it back the other way. Sort of loosen it up and then continue. Very nice. Not too badly corroded and it did not take any of the aluminum threads out. This was pretty much a perfect extraction. When you're done, blast those off. There you go. Guys, I got lucky again. No heat needed. If you wanted to use heat, it's the same as the bearings. Just kind of work your way around the stud, like so, in a circle. But this is really nice. I love it when that happens. Oh yeah, another clean extraction. And I can go ahead and re-zinc plate these later down the road when I put everything back together. All right, guys, we have just a few little things left to extract. That's out. Oil drain. 
Oh, I almost missed this. There's a little steel plate behind uh, this piece of the Kickstarter assembly I just took out. So be mindful of that. Almost missed it. All right, guys, we're down to the point where we just need to get all the oil off this. I use soap and water, Dawn dish soap. I get a bucket. I loosen everything up. I scrub it really well. And then I make sure all the oil is off before I put it through one of the two blast cabinets over there. I'm not going to bore you with sticking this thing in a soapy bucket, but I will show you how you get your gaskets off. You can use a razor blade and just sort of scrape. Some of these things will come off easily. Some of these things require a little more force. And then for some of this grease and grime, a really good buddy of mine gave me one of these plastic picks. It's got like a flat head on one end and a point on the other. I actually don't know where to get it, but I love this thing. And you can kind of just scrape and remove some of this bigger stuff. Uh, when I'm in the soap and water bucket, I'll use some brushes on this too. Make sure I get all this stuff off. I don't want any of these oil or contaminants to go inside of either of my blast cabinets because we will be using both today. Yeah, this one's got a bunch of silicone on that. I don't know if that's factory or if that's it's been split in the past, but get everything good and clean. And then next up, we are doing some blasting. I'm gonna tell you guys everything I do to get this looking like this. All right, guys, we are down to the point where this thing has been soaked in soapy water, Dawn dish soap, a little bit of Simple Green. I attacked all of the gaskets that were stuck to the case house with a razor blade and the little pick that I showed you earlier. I've taken a few minutes and used some compressed air and blasted all the water, all the residual water out of this case half. We don't want any water going into the dry blast cabinet. We're going into the dry blast cabinet first before we go into the vapor blasting cabinet. And this is, for me, what I think makes the way I blast really awesome. Now don't worry if you don't have a dry blast cabinet or if you only have a dry blast cabinet, you can still do a really good job. We'll go over that in a minute. And as you can already see, this case looks quite a bit better than it did in the very beginning, which is really great because if it looks this good now, it's gonna look even better in a minute. And this gives you a really good idea of what we're shooting for right now. So let's head on over to the blast cabinet, the dry blast cabinet. We're gonna hit this thing with glass bead 13 glass bead or very fine glass bead at 90 PSI. It's a really high pressure. I haven't had any issues yet with fatiguing the bead. Uh, I've heard that if you blast at too high a PSI, you can actually crack or shatter the beads, which would render them pretty useless. But so far, so good. It's working really well. The reason we go into the dry blast cabinet first is because if you were to shoot this at 90 PSI inside your vapor blasting cabinet, you would not be able to see anything. It'd be like being at the beach in the prime of the most dense fog you've ever experienced like you would not be able to see this very well you'd have your face smashed into the glass and it's just a nightmare so so again we're going to go into the dry blast cabinet ultra fine glass bead it's the finest glass bead i can get at 90 psi that's going to give me a very smooth very buttery base finish and also if there's anything i missed like gasket material a little bit of sealant whatever that might be. I don't care if it gets into the dry blast cabinet. That's kind of where I like to keep my contaminated beads, so to speak. So it's a great last defense on any little contaminants before it actually goes into the vapor blasting process. All right, phase one, dry blast. Go ahead and stick this sucker in your dry blaster. Again, ultra fine glass bead, 90 PSI regulated, which down there is my regulator and water separator. Now, although this cabinet does have a vacuum that keeps dust moving through it, you still wanna wear a respirator or a dust mask of some kind. Uh, no matter how well you think this thing's getting ventilated, it's just not worth it. You'll be able to smell a little bit of funk, so keep yourself protected. You can see my wife <laughs> wore this one. I must've made her blast. That's her makeup, that's hilarious. So we'll be wearing this, we'll be firing this sucker up, and we'll be getting to work. guys this is 90 psi dry blast only ultra fine glass bead it looks really good if you stopped right here i mean it'd be nothing to be ashamed of so the caveats between the vapor blasting cabinet and the dry blasting cabinet are this if you want that chromed out look let's check this out if you want that chromed out look you need vapor vapor is very low psi we're going to get into that in a minute so you could actually have a vapor blasting cabinet and a pretty small compressor. If you want to get it to this stage I just showed you a second ago, you can't run the vapor blasting cabinet that high. Like I said, you won't be able to see. Maybe you could tough it out. It would just suck. Now, if you want a dry blasting cabinet, 
they are a lot cheaper than the vapor blasting cabinet. I think that was eight grand. I think those cabinets are under a thousand. But then if you're gonna go 90 PSI, you need a big ass air compressor. So while you can blast low PSI, which is the ticket, which we're about to get into in the vapor, you need a super big compressor uh, for the dry blast uh, if you wanna do this first. So, so I am not Johnny Law on this whole blasting thing. This is just what I do. Uh, more so I want to inspire you and actually bring this stuff to light so you can try your own things. Uh, I will tell you that uh, the fine glass bead is pretty much the best I've gotten. I've tried bigger glass beads. They just aren't quite uh, on the same level as this. So, so like I said, this is dry blast only. You guys are getting a nice, nice shine, but it's still satin. Uh, it still looks great. If you want to get chromed out, you got to go vapor. And we're about to jump into that right now. So if we're going into the vapor blasting cabinet next, don't we need a different media to get this case looking as good as the other half? Well, no, I actually use the same glass bead in both cabinets. And there are a few reasons for this. One, it's about the best blast media I can find to get this type of shine. And two, if I were to go ahead and throw this from the dry blast cabinet into the vapor blasting cabinet, which is exactly what we're gonna do, I don't have to worry about mixing the medias. So they'll be the same size. Uh, for example, if I had aluminum oxide in the dry blast and I hit this first, uh, I would have to worry about getting aluminum oxide into the vapor blasting cabinet. We don't want them to cross contaminate. We don't want to have aluminum oxide in the vapor blaster. That stuff cuts really hard and really fast. And as such, you will not get the same finish. So definitely a great idea if you're doing it this particular way to have the same media in both cabinets. What's cool about the dry blast, you can easily dump it and throw something else in. If you had an aluminum oxide based project, maybe you were gonna sear coat something. Maybe you needed to strip some paint. You could just dump that stuff out blow everything out, put your glass bead back in it. It's not that easy on the vapor blaster. It's actually kind of a mess sometimes. All right, guys, let's do it. We're gonna get this sucker into stage two, the vapor blasting cabinet. We're gonna get this thing looking really, really good. And when it comes out, I'll talk to you about the pressures I use in the vapor blasting cabinet versus the dry blast, why, and then you'll see the difference here. Guys, we did it. We have a beautiful set of vapor blasted cases. These suckers look better than new. They are ready to be put back into service. So when I was in the vapor blasting cabinet, you're gonna wanna run that PSI as low as you can. That machine without any help from the air compressor actually still puts out about 23 PSI just from the sump motor. And so you can crank that thing down about that low and just let the beads do their job. Super, super low PSI is what brings out this shine. And you know, it's really funny what you find. You guys may notice in some of my B-roll shots that these things are not really even the same color. Turns out after a closer inspection and cleaning them both up, that these case halves are from two different engines. We have a major misalignment in the intake tract where the reed cage goes. Part of the casting is further back and more shallow than the other case. And then the other case, this one here actually looks very almost glossy where this one just looks really, really bright, which is kind of more typical. This was a little bit unusual when I was done with it, but uh, it looks really good. Other things, somebody wedged a screwdriver into the ass of this thing because they didn't want to use a proper case splitter, I guess. Uh, so they marred up the cases pretty good. And it looks like that could have happened on the engine this came from and also the engine this came from. I'm not really sure. Such is the mystery with used dirt bikes. The last way to tell these things were definitely split in the past. 
is this thing is like loaded with silicone or sealant or Yama bond or something. And I'm not surprised because these things are not flat by any means and they probably needed a little help. So, so anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. I loved making it for you. If it made your life better, if it enlightened you, if it got you to think, if it inspired you, please share it. I would be so pumped if you could do that for me. As always, don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, keep it pinned and I will see you soon.